Let's start our first section. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Sergei Avakumo from University of Copenhagen, uh, who will speak about uh, a recent breakthrough of him and uh, Karim Deposit and Roman Karasov. Uh, and he will speak uh, about uh, sub-exponential triangulation of, um, of the uh, projective space. So, Sergei. Uh, Thank you, Grisha, for uh, inviting me here, and thank you for uh, organizers and all the participants for coming. Uh, so, uh, as Grisha said, this is a joint work with Karim and Raman. And uh, yeah, let's start. Okay, doesn't work. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the problem we are concerned uh, is the minimum uh, size triangulation of a manifold. And by size, I mean the uh, number of vertices you need uh, to triangulate the manifold. And uh, we're uh, interested in uh, not just singular manifolds, but uh, in the families which depend on a certain parameter like dimension. So as a trivial example, you may consider the n-dimensional sphere and then we know that uh, you need n plus two vertices to triangulate it. Then uh, surprisingly, uh, we don't know uh, much more uh, about non-trivial examples. So uh, here I wrote a few inequalities, which we know for the uh, n-dimensional torus as one to them for the RPN, which is the goal of this talk and for uh, the complex projective space. So as you can see, uh, the bounds which we have are uh, not very close together. So there is a large gap between them. Uh, the lower bounds are all quadratic while the uh, upper bounds, so constructions are at least exponential. So uh, it was a surprise to us that uh, somehow we managed to uh, find the construction here for RPN, which is uh, not exponential in size, although it's still uh, larger than polynomial. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the best previous result for RPN was uh, by uh, Jenk and uh, Venturella, and uh, their construction uh, was uh, gave a very interesting, very interesting uh, inequality where. Essentially, they had uh, proved that uh, the size of this triangulation, uh, they constructed a triangulation which grows as Fibonacci numbers, which unfortunately are also exponential, but at least it's better than two to them. So uh, this is the result I'm going to speak about. So here we uh, construct the triangulation of RPN of this size. So essentially it's uh, e to the square root of n log n, or more or less square root of n to the n. And uh, yeah, moreover, I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, this triangulation is uh, actually in some sense a polytop. So, uh, which is also very surprising. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, first, uh, let's. Uh, notice that if we have a triangulated RPN, then we can pass to its universal color, which will be a triangulated sphere as n. And it will have the following properties that uh, this n-dimensional sphere is symmetric. And uh, the closed stars of any two opposite uh, vertices of this sphere are disjoint, which is equivalent to the uh, fact that the distance between any two opposite vertices is at least three. And by distance, I mean the edge distance. So the minimum number of edges you need to go from, uh, from a vertex to the opposite vertex. And then in other direction, uh, it also works. So if you give me a symmetric triangulation of a sand which satisfies these two properties, 
then the quotient of this triangulation will be a triangulation of RPM. So uh, essentially, we the object which we need is the symmetric triangulation of SN with uh, this property on the uh, distance between opposite vertices. So here is a simple example. So for RP1, you can take a symmetric triangulation of the circle, which will be a hexagon. Uh, the distance between opposite vertices is exactly three, which is fine. And the quotient of this thing is a triangle, which is a minimal triangulation of RP1. Uh, so why is it important that the distance is at least three? Because you can consider this simple example. If instead of a hexagon, you take a square, the distance between opposite vertices is two, and you take the quotient, and the quotient is no longer a, uh, triangulation because you get two different uh, edges between one and two. And so a two-dimensional example, uh, you can consider uh, this uh, icosahedron. You can see it from the top. And then icosahedron is a symmetric triangulation of S2 and the distance between opposite vertices is three. So the quotient will be uh, RP2. And this is actually the minimal triangulation of RP2 with six vertices. Okay, so uh, here's uh, how we're going to proceed then. So uh, our construction is actually a refinement of a triangulation of a cross polytope. So a cross polytope uh, is a symmetric sphere. Uh, so it satisfies the first property we need. But unfortunately, the distance between opposite vertices is uh, only two, and we want uh, it to be three. So we start with the cross polytope, and then uh, we number the vertices from 1 to n and the opposite vertices from minus 1 to minus n. And then uh, we have two distinct facets in our cross polytope which are called positive and negative facets. And uh, what we do next, we somehow uh, refine the triangulation of the positive facet and then symmetrically to preserve symmetry we do the same with the negative facet. So we add some new vertices but only in the positive and in the negative facet. Uh, now, let us notice that uh, each side facet of the cross polytope, so the one which is not positive and not negative, is actually a join of two uh, simplices, sigma and minus tau, where sigma is a, uh, some face of the positive facet and minus tau is a face of a negative facet. And moreover, sigma and tau are just uh, facets such that they uh, are disjoint facets. So uh, since we triangulate, somehow refined the triangulation of positive facet and negative facet, we added some new vertices. Uh, so we need to somehow uh, extend this triangulation to the side facets, uh, which we do in the most natural way without adding any new additional vertices. So uh, it's much better to see in the picture. So uh, we start with the cross polytope, uh, in this case, two dimensional cross polytope. Uh, in the next step, we somehow refine the triangulation of the positive facet one, two, three by adding two new vertices in the picture. And symmetrically, we add these vertices minus four, minus five in the negative facet. So as you can see, this is not a triangulation anymore because uh, we have, let's say, this two dimensional facet one, five, three, minus two with four vertices, which is not good. So uh, we uh, refine the side facets with the blue edges in the picture uh, without adding any new vertices. And uh, so in this particular example, you can see that uh, this is still not good enough because, uh, for example, we have a vertex number of five and the vertex min uh, minus five. And you can go from uh, five to minus five in only two steps going from the vertex number two. So. Uh, in this particular case, uh, our refinement of the uh, positive facet wasn't good enough. So uh, let us think what condition on this refinement we need so that it uh, is actually good enough for us. Okay. So as you remember, every side facet uh, is actually a join of uh, two faces, sigma and tau, where sigma belongs to a positive facet and minus tau belongs to a negative facet. So imagine we have a, uh, we did our construction and somehow we still have a short path between x and minus x, which goes through some vertex y. 
So uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, we can imagine that X and Y both lie in positive facet. So the edge X, Y lies in the positive facet and the edge uh, Y minus X lies in the side facet. So since it lies in, in the side facet, it means that uh, it is connecting uh, the phase sigma in the positive facet and the phase minus tau in the negative facet. Uh, but then it means that, um, yeah, it means that the edge uh, x, y, which was completely in the positive facet, actually connects uh, sigma and tau in this positive facet. So, uh, so this is what we want to prevent. So what I'm claiming now is that uh, our triangulation uh, T of the positive facet will be good if uh, for any two faces sigma and tau which lie in the positive facet and which are disjoint, there is no uh, edge between this sigma and tau. So any path in the, uh, between two opposite faces or disjoint faces uh, must be of length at least two. So let's see an example. Uh, so this is a, a two-dimensional example. And uh, in two-dimensional example, uh, the only, uh, if, if you want to find two faces of this triangle, which are disjoint, it can only be a vertex and uh, an opposite edge. So why this, is, uh, this triangulation is bad? Because you can go from uh, this top vertex to the bottom edge in only one step. So this is not what we want. And this would be a good example because here, uh, if you go from any vertex to the opposite edge, you need to do at least two steps. Uh, so, uh, for example, you might notice that uh, any two vertices uh, are opposite. So, if uh, so, in particular, it means that our triangulation T must have a property that every uh, every edge is uh, subdivided at least once because. Uh, otherwise, we could go from a vertex of our original uh, facet to the opposite vertex in just one step. So uh, this condition is necessary, but uh, it's not uh, sufficient in the higher dimensions. So essentially, you need to somehow add more vertices. Uh, okay. So or, yeah. By the way, any questions so far? So don't. Don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me or ask something. Okay. So uh, let us now uh, reinterpret this condition uh, in a more geometric way. So now we consider our uh, facet, which we want to triangulate, as a, a unit uh, simplex on unit spherical simplex on a sphere. So in this case, two dimensional simplex. So, uh, and we, we will be looking for triangulations which are geometric. So uh, vertices will lie on the sphere and the edges will be uh, geodesics. So uh, in this case, it means that uh, any two uh, faces of the simplex sigma and tau which are disjoint, any geodesic between them uh, has length exactly uh, 90 degrees. So in this two dimensional case, any geodesic between this vertex and the opposite edge is of length 90 degrees. And the same works in higher dimensions. So essentially we want to find this geometric triangulation where all the edges are strictly shorter than uh, 90 degrees. And this would... So uh, now a little bit of notation. Uh, so what we will do, uh, we will... Uh, uh, to triangulate the spherical simplex, we will pick some of the vertices of its barycentric subdivision and, that, and then just take the convex hull of uh, this uh, set of vertices. So first, how do we denote the vertices of the barycentric subdivision? Uh, we can think of them in the usual way uh, when uh, we consider the vertices of the original simplex as singletons one through n from the set of elements from one to n. And then every vertex of the barycentric subdivision is a, some subset of this uh, set from one to n. Uh, 
And geometrically, we can also consider these vertices as uh, unit vectors because these points, they lie on the sphere. And so they define the corresponding unit vector with, uh, with some coordinates. So for example, the center of the simplex has coordinates one over square root of three, all three of them equal. So uh, in the sequel, I will uh, talk about this uh, vertices of barycentric subdivision as subsets of the set from one to n and also as unit vectors. Okay. So uh, what we're gonna do, let's say in the two-dimensional case, uh, we just pick some vertices of barycentric subdivision. In this picture, only the uh, middles of edges, but not the middle of the whole triangle. And then we take uh, the convex hull or the Delaunay triangulation, this thing. So in this case, it will be this picture. And as you can see, uh, in this picture, you cannot go from any vertex to the opposite edge in one step. So you need uh, two steps, uh, which is good enough. So it means that uh, well, this very simple example shows that to achieve our goal, you actually don't need to take all the vertices of a barycentric subdivision. And this is good for us because in total, as you know, there are two to the n such vertices. So taking all of them would be uh, too much for us. Uh, it, we will not be able to get a uh, good bound. Okay. Uh, so uh, now skip that. Uh, so what are actually the uh, conditions of this? So uh, V is this set of uh, vertices of barycentric subdiv subdivision, which we uh, want to take and then take the convex hull. So what do we want from V so that all the edges of our Delaunay triangulation are strictly shorter than 90 degrees? So imagine that uh, in V we have two vertices A and B such that uh, uh, the distance between them is 90 degrees, which means that their uh, inner product is zero. So here I consider A and B as unit vectors. Uh, so uh, suppose there are such A and B. So what we don't want to happen, we don't want A and B to be in the same uh, facet of our Delaunay triangulation. So suppose they are A and B are here. Then uh, there is a normal to this facet, which we denote by X. And then we notice that uh, since it is a facet, then X, uh, then points, um, there, then there are no other points which are closer to X than points A and B. So if we manage to find the point C, uh, which is also in our set V, such that C is closer to X than A uh, or B, uh, then we know that A and B are not in the same facet. Uh, so again, uh, for any point A and B in our set V, we want to find the third point C also in our set V, such, uh, such that either this, pro, uh, this inequality holds or this inequality holds. Okay. Sergey, can you repeat this again, the, the uh, condition? Yeah, uh, so uh, we don't, so we have points A and B, which will be vertices of our Delnet triangulation, and the distance between them is 90 degrees, so uh, in the product is zero. And we don't want them to be in the same facet. Uh, so uh, suppose they are in the same facet, then we can take the normal of this facet, which is X uh, here in the picture. And then, uh, uh, then uh, suppose, yeah, suppose now that there is a third point C, which is also a vertex, and which is strictly closer than, to X than A and O B. Well, then uh, it means that A and B are not in the same facet, because uh, because then, um, yeah. Uh, is it clear? Because then uh, it will contradict the fact. So, uh, so uh, everything except for this, uh, the fact that they are not in uh, the same facet is clear. But at least I, I mean I don't see immediately. It's a conditional uh, the Lenate triangulation. Yeah, because uh, so oh, okay. oh, this okay, is the context. Okay, okay. This is essentially yeah. So in the plane or in R n, it is essentially the definition of the Lenate triangulation. But here, uh, you can. 
yeah, you can see that uh, if the point C is closer to X, it means that uh, it is uh, that the supporting hyperplane of this facet uh, at C is on the wrong side of the supporting hyperplane of this facet, so it cannot be a, uh, a facet. So this is what we want. We want to find uh, such point C, which is also in our set V. So it is a vertex of our convex hull, such that one of these inequalities hold. OK, so now I present the uh, necessary conditions on V uh, such that uh, everything works. So necessary first, or sufficient? Uh, necessary. Oh, sorry, sufficient, yes. Yes. Uh, it says, yeah, they are sufficient, and we actually know that they are not necessary. So uh, it means that probably this construction can be somehow improved. Uh, so those uh, conditions, the first two are very simple. First, we want all the singletons to be in V because singletons are the vertices of our original um, spherical simplex. Uh, second, we want uh, this set to be closed under taken subsets. So if some uh, set A is in V, then all the subsets of A must also be in V. Uh, so geometrically, it means that if you take uh, a set of some phase, uh, then all the centers of subfaces of this phase are also in there. And the third condition is uh, a little bit weird. Uh, I was told that, that it reminds people of Metroid somehow. So this is somehow an, an exchange condition. So for any A and B such that, such that they are disjoint. So here uh, I consider A and B as subsets of uh, set one to N. And the fact that they're disjoint is equivalent to the to saying that the inner product is zero, because uh, yeah, so it's easy to see. And uh, so these are two conditions which we want. Either this one or this one must be satisfied. And this is essentially the same condition. Just uh, the second one is is the same as the first one, just with A and B uh, swapped. So okay. Uh, so yeah, essentially we just want to find such element and I, I and A and J and B such that we can uh, both add J to A and uh, remove uh, add I to B while removing uh, J. So uh, yeah, okay. So uh, now I'll kind of I'm gonna prove. Uh, yeah, so what remains now is to first uh, prove uh, why these conditions are sufficient. And the second step would be, we would want to find a set, a set V which satisfies these conditions and which is not too large. So first I'm gonna prove the sufficiency because it's a little bit more tricky. So let's do that. Uh, so without the loss of generality, we can say that uh, A, uh, so A, B, and X are uh, as in this picture. Um, yeah, so we're given A and B such that the inner product is zero. We have X, which is the uh, supposedly the unit normal to the facet which contains A and B. And we want to, to find the third point C, which is closer to X than to um, than A is or than B is. Uh, so, yeah. So A is some unit uh, unit vector with these coordinates. So we can assume that the first small A coordinates are all equal and non-zero, and the rest of them are zeros. So uh, B is uh, a vector such that the inner product of A is zero. So the first A coordinates of B are zero, and the JF coordinate. Uh, will be something uh, depending on the size of B. And then X is this unit normal. And uh, it has some coordinates here, which would, we may assume that they are uh, increasing. And there is also coordinate XJ on this J position. Uh, okay. So, so what is J? It's the total number of non-zero coordinates? Uh, no, sorry. So I and J are as in here in this condition. So uh, ah, okay, okay, okay. So there are specific i uh, 
element i here and j and b, uh, and b. so uh, those are this i and j so here so you are not listing all the coordinates of uh, uh, yeah so we and... go up to j and we don't care what happens after j uh, right okay mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah so first uh, assume we can assume that x j uh, j f coordinate of x, x is less than uh, i f coordinate than x i. Uh, well, suppose it's true. Uh, then uh, we have this point C, uh, which is this one. Uh, so uh, what happens here? We uh, add i to b, so this coordinate becomes non-zero, but we remove j, so this coordinate becomes zero. So the total number of coordinates in b doesn't change, so uh, their uh, values are also the same. So they will stay one over square root of b. And this point uh, will lie in our set uh, v by our condition, this one. So this is this point. So it, it lies in there. And now you can see that uh, then this point c is actually closer to uh, x than uh, b is because the inner product of c with x is greater than inner product of b with x. Well, because in B, we have this uh, product xj with this number, and in uh, C, we will have xi with this number. Uh, but since we assume that xi is greater than xj, then uh, we will get that uh, C is closer to uh, x. So, uh, and then we're done. So, uh, which means that now we can assume the opposite that xj is actually greater than xi, or greater or equal. And now we also know that this is greater than x1. Uh, now, uh, what can we do next? So we can consider now uh, two different points, c1 and c2. Uh, so uh, c1 uh, is just a remove the first coordinate. So the coordinates of c1 will look like that. Uh, so there, all the non-zero coordinates will be one over square root of a minus one because we have uh, le one less coordinate than uh, we had before. And since it's a unit vector, then we need to change the coordinates slightly. And then C2 is, uh, has the same non-zero coordinates as a, plus it has uh, a non-zero coordinate at the jth place. So, uh, and which means that the coordinates themselves will be slightly uh, smaller. They will be one over square root of a plus one. So uh, let's see then uh, what happens with our inner products. So x with a will be this number, just the sum of coordinate of uh, coordinates of x divided by square root of a. x with c1 will be this number, uh, and x with c2 will be this number, uh, which we know is greater than this because we know that xj is greater than x1. Uh, okay, so and now it, it remains to prove that either x product of c1 or x product of c2 is greater than x product of a. Uh, so again, I just rewrote the products. And now we see that they're kind of actually very similar to each other. So we uh, uh, define a function f alpha which is this, uh, where alpha is some parameter. And uh, we see that uh, x product a is just f of one, x product c1 is f of zero, and x product c2 is uh, or greater than f of two. So, uh, so you see that uh, one lies between zero and two, so we actually just need now to prove that this function is convex and then we're done because then it would mean that uh, this number is less than either this one or this one. Okay, so well, but this fu function is convex almost always because, so we write it like that and you can see that it is actually a sum of a linear function of um, this number and the uh, inverse function of this number. So uh, there are several possibilities here uh, so what can happen? It can be either strictly convex if uh, the this number is uh, positive. Yeah, so we know that this number is positive by 
uh, or the previous things. So, or, or at least not negative. So if this number is strictly positive, then this function is convex and this function is linear, their sum is convex. And uh, there is also a case where this number is zero, which is only possible if all the coordinates are the same. Uh, and then, uh, then this function can be either, then this function in total is linear and it is either non-constant if x1 is um, positive or it can be zero if x1 is zero and all of these coordinates are zero. But uh, this, the general case when all coordinates uh, from x1 to xa are zero, uh, we deal with it like that. Uh, so if everything is zero, then uh, it means that product of x with a is zero, but then uh, we just find some singleton c in v uh, such that uh, this product is positive and we can find this singleton because uh, x is a unit vector, so it must have at least one non-zero coordinate, one positive coordinate, and we just pick a singleton which uh, contains this coordinate and the product will be positive. So uh, the point is that in all three cases, uh, we have that uh, either this number or this number is greater than uh, this number, x product a, so it means that either C1 or C2 are closer to uh, X than the point A. So, uh, and this uh, finishes the proof of sufficiency. Uh, so I actually have some time left. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, come back to actually to the sufficient conditions here. Uh, so uh, what we just did, we proved the sufficiency of these conditions. And uh, what, as I said, what remains is to actually find uh, a set V which satisfies these conditions and which is not too large. So we're gonna do that now. Uh, so uh, this is some, uh, this is a construction of uh, a relatively small set V, which satisfies these previous conditions. And uh, it goes like that. So we have our set from one to N and we partition it into these joint groups. And then uh, V is uh, uh, those subsets, which can take, uh, so those subsets which intersect with uh, all of these groups by at most one element, except for maybe one group where we can take as many elements as we want. Uh, so let me give you an example. So let's say uh, N is 16, then we partition N uh, in let's say four groups. And then we can have this set which contains three elements from the first group no elements from the second group, one element from the third group, and no elements from the fourth group. So this is uh, this lies in our V because it contains multiple elements only from the first group. And then this set contains multiple elements only from the second group. And then again, this element only from the first group and this only from the second group. So all of these sets would, uh, would lie in our uh, set V. Do colors mean anything here? Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, so this is just, a, mm, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, yeah, so I have five minutes left. Uh, so I'll actually try to prove why uh, these, uh, these conditions, uh, this construction satisfies our previous conditions. So it, it is more or less obvious that all the singletons lie in V uh, because they cannot intersect any group by more than one element. And uh, this condition is also closed under taking subsets. So these two easy conditions are fine. Now we need to check our uh, weird uh, substitution condition. And then there are two cases uh, and the proof is basically by picture. So uh, there are two possible cases. So A is our 
uh, some element in V. Uh, and uh, there is a specific group out of these four where A has more than one element, in this case, the first group. And uh, the first case is when, is when in this big uh, group of A, B also has an element. In this case, this one uh, element. And then we just say that uh, some element in here is I and some element, uh, and this element which B has in this group is J. And then again, proof by picture, you can see that A plus J uh, looks like this. Uh, so it is the same as A, we just add the J element, which is orange here. Uh, and uh, this uh, satisfies our uh, conditions here because we don't have more than one element in more than one group. And uh, B plus I minus J will look like this. Uh, so we add element I and we remove element J. So again, this satisfies our conditions because uh, we don't create a group in which this thing has more than, uh, we don't create an additional group in which this thing has more than one element. And uh, the second case is uh, when in the uh, group where A is large, in this case, it would be the second group, B has nothing. And then uh, again, you can see by picture that uh, A plus J and B plus I minus J uh, are fine. So they lie in D as we wanted. So uh, finally, let me, uh, let me actually uh, count how large the set V will be. Uh, so I didn't specify how do we partition V in groups. So now I'll just say that we will have K groups and they will be roughly of the same size n over k, s equal n over k. Uh, then uh, how, how many elements we'll have in V. So this is the simple, count, uh, simple counting argument. So first of all, we have k choices uh, for the group in which A will have multiple elements. Uh, then since the size of this group is s, then once we pick this group, we will have two to the s choices of which specific elements we'll take from this group. And uh, in all the remaining groups, we only take one element. So uh, we will have uh, S plus one choices for each of these groups. And there are K minus one of them. So we'll have S plus one to the K minus one. So essentially this number, and then uh, if uh, in this number you plug S equal uh, K equal square root of N, then we get this number which is our uh, bound. So, and you can see that this is uh, less than exponential. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so uh, it would be a nice time to uh, have any questions. So I have one question, Sergey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, your condition is really uh, is just sufficient, but can you somehow relax so, it a bit? Uh, this one. Yes, something. Uh, so, okay, so uh, it cannot be... Uh, so, uh, as you've seen for the proof, we, uh, we use all of these three things. So, but it doesn't mean that uh, you cannot invent something better. So uh, we have some other con some other set of conditions, uh, which uh, which are also sufficient, uh, but we uh, I we don't use them because they actually give you worse bound, but they're different from uh, this set. So there is some uh, some space for uh, creativity here left. Uh, so I mean. In general, the main idea is uh, to able to swap uh, one coordinate and uh, yeah. increase the inner product. Yeah. So, so it might be formulated as a purely combinatorial problem. Yeah. So you have a set with prescribed coordinates. All of them have like uh, the same value in each non-zero coordinate. Yeah. And then uh, you you want to find a set such that uh, in any two you can. Uh, 
for any tool, you can you can find a better, let's say, a better a better vector in, in your sense. Yeah. You know, so. so for <laughs> any two disjoint sets, so that the product is uh, zero, you you, should, you want to find some third uh, set which is better somehow than one of these two. Yes. So you can formulate it like that, but then uh, it's uh, it's hard to analyze. So what we did instead, we uh, so I would say it's Kupavsky style problem. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can discuss it actually later because uh, I thought about it a little bit and I couldn't do anything better, uh, but I don't see why this should be the best construction possible. So. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, how, how uh, I mean, uh, can you efficiently, can you compute for small n, say this v? Do you know, can, can, do you have any numbers? Uh, so, uh, because it is known, I know that at least for first, for two, three, and four, it is known, right? The answer is yeah, known. yeah, yeah, uh, so I, I mean, know okay. that uh, this is, uh, for, la for small n's, this is, uh, this is too large, this is uh, bigger than uh, the best bounds. How large? How large? Can you estimate? Uh, well, for two, for, say, for two. Uh, well, you, you can just plug square root of n in here. And uh, uh, and this, I don't actually know what will it be. So it grows something like square root of n to the square root of n without any constants, right? More or less. So, um, mm -hmm. so for uh, small numbers where we know the precise uh, smallest uh, triangulation, it will be too large. But mm -hmm. uh, already for something like of dimension 10 or 20, it, it might be the best known or something. So, yeah. But the, what, in the newest fact, it will be some polynomial. What, what, what? There are some conjecture about that, do you know? Some conjecture about the minimum triangulation? Uh, um, no. So, uh, yeah, as I showed in the beginning, so the lower bound we have is quadratic. And yeah, the yeah. upper bound up until now was uh, uh, Fibonacci numbers. So, uh, and, and there is no like, so uh, I don't think anyone, okay, so, I don't think anyone believes that it should be polynomial, but well, no, it's yeah. So it's anyone anyone's guess. So this number is kind of uh, kind of ugly in the sense that it, it would be weird if this would be the precise uh, upper bound or close to precise upper bound. But on the other hand, it's kind of not very believable that uh, you can do something polynomial. So I would assume it's something uh, uh, over polynomial, but I don't know how, how much over. It can be n to the log n, for example. I mm -hmm. wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens. So. Sergey, thanks, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask, specifically for for this construction that you mm -hmm. do so uh, octahedron based do you have any better lower bound uh, better than n squared uh, or, uh, ah, okay i see so uh what if we do exactly what we're doing but uh just uh, lower bound for this combinatorial problem so uh yeah i see so the answer is no. So, uh, uh, so for example, uh, it would be interesting to, uh, so this construction which I presented, it's not only a symmetric triangulation of SN, it is actually a polytope because we take convex hulls of points. And even for symmetric polytopes with this condition on the distance between opposite points, at least three, uh, there is nothing better than a quadratic lower bound. And actually this quadratic row bound, it works uh, not only for uh, RPN, it works for uh, weak RPN, which is just a simplicial complex, which has uh, some homotopical properties of RPN. So this lower bound, it doesn't use the fact that it is a manifold. It doesn't use the fact that uh, we want a polytope. 
So it seems that there is a lot of uh, space for improvement for there. But uh, again, we don't have anything better. Okay, thank you. It seems to me that it's time to move on for our next speaker and we can continue our discussion later on.